Hi, thank you everybody for coming back from having lunch to the second part of the second day. It's actually going to be very, very much exciting. Um, so yesterday, I, after the first day, which was a wonderful day, I went to give a lecture and I told the people in that lecture, it was a company in Tel Aviv, I told them that we're going to have the Cyber Week. And people from 50 countries arrived at the Cyber Week. And they didn't understand, and actually only Hebrew speakers will understand the next part, they didn't understand why more than 50, uh, from people from more than 50 countries arrived at the um, Book Affair Week. I don't know how to call it in English. Because in Hebrew, Book Affair Week and Cyber Week sounds the same. And we have the same weeks right now. So Shavua Sefer and Shavua Cyber. So it's not the Book of Fear Week, it's the Cyber Week, and this is the second half of the second day, and we're gonna have some amazing things on the stage now. But before we will begin, I wanna show you a short video clip of what we had here on Sunday on this Israeli Cyber Challenge. I don't know who will see this. אני פה באיזה מחסן, באמצע שום מקום, על כרומקי. אני לא יודע מי לקח אותי ולמה. מה, זה בגלל התוכנית? אבל למה? למי היא מפריעה? אז כואב להם שאני מצליח עכשיו? אם זה כדי לקבל כסף, אף אחד לא ישלם בשבילי, ואני אשאר תקוע פה לנצח. אני ממש לא בנוי לזה, אני לא איזה מגייבר או ג'יימס בונד שיכול להיחלץ ממצבים כאלה. בבקשה, תצילו אותי, תעזרו לי, אני רוצה לחיות. אני חייב לסגור, אני שומע מישהו מגיע. Welcome to the Israeli Cyber Challenge. This is probably one of the most exciting plays you would find here in this Cyber Week. We have hackers, 30 groups of hackers trying to solve different puzzles, different hacking puzzles. We are trying to find out who's going to be the winner in this amazing place. You should look around, you would see different ages, people, teenagers, people from the army, consultants, different people working together and who's going to be the winner we are going to find out soon enough the main mission is like helping guri you got a lot you, you accessing uh, uh, main page where you got a lot of mission uh, every every mission you solve you get in you get in more points we got a four and a half hours to solve the missions in the main cyber challenge event we have the board, the leaderboard, each and every group in this challenge can see what's its current score. So we don't know who's going to be the winner, but we know that the tension is up, everybody here is working, and they're trying to solve the next challenge to make sure that they're going to be on the first space. Our tactic is to uh, choose uh, one exercise and uh, put uh, all, of, all of our minds together uh, in this exercise. רציתי להגיד תודה לצוות שסייע בחילוץ שלי. תודה לכולכם, בזכותכם אני חופשי. <laughs> האמת שמסתבר שהם לא, לא התכוונו באמת לחטוף אותי, זאת הייתה טעות בזהות. הת, התבלבלו ביני לבין אסי. And the second place is Cyberdog. The first place goes to Israelite. The first place is Israel and with the world in the name of thousands of hackers or parasites of the internet. Cyber Week 2016 presents Business Executives Talk Cyber. That 
was an amazing event. I'm not sure if you had a chance to go there, but the Israeli Cyber Hacking Challenge was amazing. We had so many talented people there. Um, we are already starting to work on the next one with the Air Force Unit OFEC. Thank you, for thank you so much for being part of that. So we're going to start our first session. So I want to call to the stage Yoav Leitelsdorf. Managing partner at YL Ventures. You have, you have has been a successful tech entrepreneur and inventor for the past two decades. YL Ventures, which he founded, invests in early stage cybersecurity, cloud computing, big data, and software as a service uh, software companies. And accelerate their evolution uh, via strategic advice and Silicon Valley based operation uh, execution. YL Venture is currently investing out of its 27.5 million second found. Um, you have the stage is yours. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Great to see everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, without further ado, I'd like my. Uh, panelists to come up here, Justin, Anand, and Jeff. They got mics, that's great. Here, let's just have a seat over here. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, so we're going to have a nice, lively uh, chat over here about security. I think we're first going to start with, uh, with introductions and uh, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and also their organizations. So we'll start with Justin. Justin Somaini, Chief Security Officer of SAP. Thank you and thank you for having me. Is this working? Is this working? Yes, it's working. Uh, Justin Somaini, Chief Security Officer at SAP, owning everything from physical security, product security, infrastructure, and, and globally. Um, we, we obviously are very focused on security, not just for our own protection, but obviously in the products and services that we drive to all of our customers. Um, before that, uh, I've lived in San Francisco and worked in many companies, uh, CISO, uh, Yahoo, Symantec, Verisign. So definitely been on the operational side for, for many, many years. And uh, okay, Anand Krishnan, please. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Anand Krishnan. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of uh, Tata Consultancy Services, uh, TCS. Uh, we are part of the global Tata group of companies, which uh, uh, is in many diverse areas, uh, ranging from steel to automobiles to uh, chemicals to communications to retail. And we are the software part of the group. Uh, I am the uh, CTO, so I'm responsible for research and development. I'm responsible for innovation partnerships uh, across the world and also for new product, new service, innovation for the company. So I have a specific interest in being on this panel because with two CISOs flanking me, I'm probably the, the business guy in the room. So. Uh, I, I'll probably contribute to that. We have a unique position in the industry value chain because we work with uh, pretty much the world's biggest corporations uh, as IT partners, as consultants, as system integrators, as uh, uh, people who provide uh, back office services and manage their data centers and so on. So we have in some ways a fiduciary duty to our customers and their customers uh, to keep their their data and their assets and other things secure. So that gives us, I think, a unique perspective. We ourselves are a corporation and we have our own security needs and our own um, uh, security uh, standards and, and processes and so on. But we also have to extend it to our ecosystem. So hope to cover some of that during the discussions today. Thanks. Thank you. And Jeff Moore, cybersecurity leader at Novartis. Hi, um, I'm Jeff, as you've heard, and I do the security for uh, Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. Uh, this is the research division of uh, Novartis, and we're pretty much the crown jewel of the organization with the biggest data in the organization. We're also the smallest uh, area. I'm responsible for all areas of technical security. I'm lucky I don't own physical security like my friend here. <laughs> so um, I'm in a unique position. <laughs> a, a better one. Physical is a little, yeah. <laughs> a little challenging. Very good. So uh, we're going to... 
go straight to it. And let's start with uh, some damage assessment, okay? Um, uh, you guys are all representatives of uh, very, very, very large organizations, uh, each, each of the three. So what, what, what's the damage you've been suffering from cyber attacks? Um, ideally, you'd answer this as an organization, or you know, if you can, then maybe more broadly about your industry. But what's, what's the dollar damage from cyber attacks you're, you're seeing? Uh, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of reports out in regards to the dollar damage and, you know, the one for me um, that's really relevant, it's not necessarily perceived dollars, but actually material uh, for credit reports to the customers, uh, the fixing of situations as they occur. Um, but if we're talking about what the real damage is, for me, it's really that loss of trust with the customer if those situations come up. And it's very hard to quantify because it's really soft dollars versus hard dollars. But once you lose that trust with your customer, um, it's very difficult, if ever possible, to regain. And so the, the impact a lot of the organizations, the mass m amount of monies that they put in post uh, incident is really to reestablish that trust. Look at Target, look at a bunch of the other organizations. Of course, there's spending money to fix the issue, but investing a significant amount of money to reestablish that trust. And it's very, very difficult to do. Anand, I, I would um, echo that, but in a, in a more specific way, uh, given the, uh, the industry positioning where we are in, as I said earlier, on the value chain, um, losing the trust of our customers, the large enterprises, is certainly much more material in, in terms of damage than an actual incident. Uh, but secondly, there is the secondary responsibility of holding end customer data or end customer records in, in might be at rest or in motion which passes through us. Uh, if that gets damaged, then a, 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 a customer of ours might be in for for, for much bigger direct damages, right? So uh, I haven't got a number on this, but I think the, the first one is, uh, is, is, is a function of what's the, the visible impact which an attacker can cause by saying that I can cause damage to this company or this industry, which is broadly speaking the service provider industry worldwide. Uh, and therefore we are a, a, a valuable target in, in, in that sense. Uh, have there been uh, uh, incidents? Certainly. Uh, have there been large? Thankfully not. Uh, but the brand damage, uh, we'd like to, you know, one of my, my uh, colleagues uh, or, or friends, a, a CTO of one of our customer companies once told me, you guys are like the Switzerland of the services industry, right? Like the Swiss banks are what they are to the financial industry. India in general is to the service industry. Right. So everybody tries to go after the Swiss banks, right? So that you know you look good if you say I hacked into X, Y, or Z. So we have to be so that the brand damage, to your point, I think is 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 the bigger issue that we worry about. Jeff, I think as we said here, it's uh, brand damage is is huge, and depending on what industry you're in, it gets even worse. If you look carefully at Malaysian Airways after losing two planes, it may not have been hacking, but they're having a huge time continuing as an airline. If Novartis gets hacked and somebody changes a formula and it kills people, no doctor is going to recommend our drugs to anybody, right? So, and that's a cost that can take down a company. I've also been in the privilege to be in a company when it was hacked that we actually made money during the hack because of uh, the way we handled our crisis management. But uh, yeah, I agree. It's all about the, the front end and trust. Trust is most important. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, cyber insurance. So PwC says that by 2020, um, annual cyber insurance policies are gonna total seven and a half billion dollars. That's just the, the premiums, not the coverage. Obviously the coverage would be well into the hundreds of billions. Um, do you know, the, the, do your organizations have uh, cyber insurance? Well, we ask the question during every conversation with a customer. Uh, whether we should take the liability of, a, of an incident or, or is it covered by something that they might have either specifically as cyber insurance or as part of a larger liability cover. Uh, and it, it, it's going case by case. So I don't think we've taken a, 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 a sort of an umbrella stand on it that we will insure all comers against uh, an event. Uh, it's, it's still going contract by contract and making sure that 
either they or we have to take the appropriate cover. In most cases, as of now, it's still covered by a more generic uh, loss and liability uh, cover. Uh, cyber, some cases, yes, whether it's like customer sensitive uh, um, concerns and so on, but it's a matter of discussion at the contract level. Yeah, I think the, the general impact of business is covered underneath the overarching business uh, insurance uh, that, that's out there that most, if not all companies have, sorry, that all companies are required to have, at least in the U.S. Uh, I think the, the premiums and coverage of cybersecurity specific insurance um, offerings is still a little bit new in regards to the scope, in regards to the requirements, and are they relative to the premiums, uh, the very significant premiums uh, that you see in the market uh, today that are required in order to get them. Um, and when the applicability, because security is so vast in every type of situation and how it can be compromised or data could be leaked um, or whatever the impact might be to the business, is still, it's still a little bit new and not necessarily proven. Very important, very significant for the industry to progress down the insurance market for damages uh, as occurred from, especially from cloud environments, but for any other business. Um, but I think it's, it's still a little bit new. But we've been talking about this for 20 some odd years in the security industry and only now are we getting to really see tangible offerings from the insurance uh, companies that are out there. So it's very exciting, but I think it's got a long way to go. Okay. Very good. Oh, Jeff? Yep. Personal opinion on cyber insurance? Stupid idea. Um, most companies that decide to go down the line of getting cyber insurance will then skimp on security because they believe they're covered. All right. Most of the companies I've talked to that have, have some of it, their security teams are actually walking away because they're having a harder time getting money to put the, the proper controls in place. Um, I agree it's in its infancy right now, and I think that when somebody gets really massively hit and one of those insurance companies do doesn't pay, I think it's going to be a different world, you know, because the insurance don't want to pay, as we all know. That's what they're, they're there for. So when they look at it, they're going to come in and start investigating the company's uh, security process, its policy, its procedure, and it may look in the future like they're going to have to have a form of, uh, like in the banking organization, Basel II uh, direction, saying what strength your company is and then look at the... If I may add a postscript to that, uh, I work a lot with insurance companies. It's one of our business segments. I spend a lot of time with the industry, both on the business side and, and on the technology side. There is, I think, a set of people in the reinsurance industry who are thinking about this as a overarching cover which an individual in insurance company might find hard to even quantify. I mean, you talked about, you know, regulations, Basel III kind of stuff. Yeah. That doesn't exist today. Yeah. Right? And I don't think people will go through the hassle of defining something like that. Whereas reinsurers, who are the super insurers who sit above insurers, they have the ability to price, um, you know, moonshot kind of risks. I mean, these are the guys who will cover, um, you know, climate change and stuff. So they have begun to think about it. We're having a dialogue with them. I'm, I'm sure other technology providers are having a dialogue with them as well, but nothing has emerged as yet as a sort of a gold standard. Yeah, not to kind of dig, drag this conversation on a little bit. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's a stupid idea to have insurance, but I do believe that fundamentally we have a problem in regards to the stochastical models to define what the premium to risk is and uh, drive it down to a financial model. I do think there's a, a massive benefit of what are the requirements that a company needs to perform in order to obtain, implement it in that the I security agree with. model. And, yeah. and that's one of the key factors of a lot of this is the insurance companies don't even know what those key factors are. Yeah. There, aren't enough data, there, there aren't enough data points right now. They're doing it. That's why I said the, the reinsurance guys have some experience in pricing one-off risks. They call it facultative risk. So. They are the only ones who are thinking about it. If you go and talk to your friendly PNC insurer, they probably won't even have the tools to say what should be your premium. There's no history or actuarial tables to say, okay, you're 50 years old, you take your medicines, and therefore this is your premium. Very good. Well, thanks for that. Um, that was very good about insurance. Now, I want to cover, I see we have 13 and a half minutes, and I want to cover another five or six topics. So every question I'm going to ask now, we're going to get one answer, okay, for one of you three. So you kind of 
rotate that around. So let's let's talk a little bit about executive buy-in. Okay, uh, you know, two of you are, are CISOs. One of you is more of a you know CTO, CIO type. But um, let's talk a little bit about how um, you know CISOs see di see things differently from the CXOs, you know, the board members, the uh, the managers of the business that are not focused on security, but rather have to put up with security. Um, so, you know, the CISO is advocating security and fighting for budgets and, and all that, and then the CXO and board members have to understand, put up with it, and, uh, and, and, and grant, you know, grant some budgets and permissions. So, anybody want to take that, that on? That Sure. Um, you, you know, uh, security is no different than any other line of business within any other company. Uh, so, I, I personally feel uh, as a, a CSO or CISO, I'm really a salesman. I'm just selling security internally. That's the only difference. So how do I establish what are the needs and demands of the other line of businesses that are competing for the same dollars? How can we find common ground? How can we find synergies on our projects? Uh, how do we bring customers into the context? Because ultimately, that's what drives businesses. Um, and being very rational about how we compete for that and prioritize our projects across the company. I mean, quite honestly, not all of my projects are a higher priority of revenue generating uh, initiatives. Um, but I think that the relationships and that, uh, that transparency and that enablement that you drive with the other line of business uh, peers really at the end of the day really fosters a significant amount of trust, a uh, significant amount of support when you truly have an issue. Um, and that, at the end, I feel really wins out. Okay, very good. Let's talk a little bit about the human element of cybersecurity. So it's not all about IDS, IPS, firewall systems. It's also about people clicking on bad links, phishing attacks, uh, you know, being susceptible to uh, social engineering and the like. Does anybody want to take up the, um, and, and tell us a little bit more about, you know, how do you deal with the human element in your organization with regards to security? Okay, I, since I'm next to you, I'll do <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it, it, it is... A hard problem. Um, you know, we have uh, 353,000 people in the company. I don't know, 100 and something countries and uh, thousands of locations and so on. Uh, and it is something that we pay a lot of attention to. So we do all the obvious stuff, but our scale makes the obvious stuff hard. Uh, even I have to go through a mandatory. Uh, you know, computer-based training program, eight hours uh, in a year, you know, click through a quiz and, and answer, you know, 18 out of 20 questions before I don't have this irritating pop-up saying that you've failed your security quiz at, for executives and so on. Um, so that's hygiene, but at, at size and scale, it's hard. Uh, we've started doing a lot of things to build the culture. Uh, you know, we use all the internal channels, our social media channels inside the company, uh, our CEO has made it one of his five things that he talks about to every employee. Any town hall that he goes, he talks about five things, and security is one of them. Uh, and we try to make that part of everybody's life. Don't, don't scare everybody out of their wits, but make sure that it's like part of, part of their lives. The, the flip side of it is that there is a lot of awareness that needs to be built in in day-to-day -day tasks. Because it's sometimes, it's just, as you said, you know, clicking on the wrong link is one part of it. But in our business, uh, you know, copying something onto a USB uh, disk is, 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 is a no-no, right? It might be your data or it might be a customer's data, even worse. It might be PII from uh, a customer's customer and so on. So we try to make sure that behaviors are, uh, are flagged, there's fun, there's, there's social media stuff. But try to catch the behaviors early. And, and the younger you catch them, usually... Uh, the, the more positive the effect. So gamify it, make it fun, make it part of everybody's life, top-down messaging. You've got to hit it from multiple angles. Good. Now, next question, it'd be great if all three of you could, could answer, and we'll, we'll start with Jeff, if, if possible. Um, so let's talk about solution categories. Um, you know, what cybersecurity solution categories are you currently looking uh, to uh, increase spending, you know, to buy more uh, reactive, so uh, detection and response versus proactive, which is prevention, deception. Um, and then what are some of the obstacles to adopting these new solution categories? So detection is probably one of the most crucial parts. And all, even your proactive and all that stuff needs a level of detection. So no, no matter what you, detection is partly key in all of it, no matter what you do. Um, the 
big issue in a lot of uh, companies like the pharmaceutical areas, we have a lot of um, qualified systems that have to go through a huge process. And a lot of the business units don't want to go through this process again, right? So we quite often have to grandfather things in or piggyback on a project of upgrading to keep those, those technologies up to date and, and in the right direction. But from the security point of view, most of the security tools out there need a level of detection even just to run a proactive thing. So in my view, it's detection and awareness. For me, awareness is key, detection is key. And yeah. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, the one new area that uh, we are investing in is in um, things that help teams, individuals, groups, locations rehearse and sort of go through drills, uh, essentially disaster response or event response drills. What do you do when a breach happens or an incident is reported? Uh, what's, so essentially, you know, practice makes perfect. That's, so that's an area that we're building some tools, we're, we're talking to some startups which have some interesting ideas in that space. Uh, and, and as a subscript of that human thing that I talked about earlier, um, I'm seeing in my labs as well as in the, uh, in the partner network that I'm responsible for, uh, we're evaluating a lot more of behavioral um, analytics software. But that still comes down to detection. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm all over the place. Um, so uh, I, I think more of the problems that I have, one, uh, how do I drive um, confidentiality from a customer? It's, uh, how do I make sure that all data, all transactions are encrypted? And really more importantly than that, how do I ensure I never need to decrypt that content in order to transact in on it? Uh, so maybe that goes into more of a, a homomorphic encryption kind of model. Um, from an analytics perspective, it's not necessarily the analytics, but more importantly, how do I reduce the time frame from alert to remediation? And yeah. so there's solutions out there that uh, I don't necessarily know if it's a category, but uh, Hexadite and others are really focusing on uh, how do I automate and streamline that process of remediation or that investigatory process of investigations? Source code analysis, especially open source source code analysis, is significantly important for us as a software producer. Um, that becomes incredibly important. Um, and there are a bunch of other ones, but those are the ones that are really top of mind. Yeah, that's great. Okay, now let's take a crystal ball, kind of try to look into the future and uh, kind of focus away from the now and into the, you know, the next five years. Um, what are some of the new upcoming greenfield kind of innovative uh, areas of, of cybersecurity, maybe areas that are not really heavily adopted right now, but will get adopted in the future. So what does what your crystal ball tell you, Jeff? So there is no real innovation in security in the last 20 years, right? We've had a very good evolution of the next steps and the next steps and the next steps. Um, and I think that's partly because the enterprises are very conservative and people want to sell to the enterprises. Um, I think we're going to look in the future a lot more to reducing that time to fix and also automation. Automation is key a lot of this. A lot of people looking at anomaly detection and it automatically triggers ticketing and all that stuff. So a lot of companies are investing in that and I see that's probably going to grow a little bit more in the near future. Especially with the future being there's going to be less and less security people from what we can see in the market. So we're going to need to have something that quantifies a lot of stuff before we actually get to it. Um, what, uh, so this is uh, something that I worry about wearing my, my research and development hat a lot. Uh, if I pick two areas that we are investing in, one is in the area of data privacy and how it's becoming the sort of inverse problem of security, that there is data that you have to disclose and make public, but you've got to make sure that it does not have any PR, you know, personally identifiable information along with it. So that's an area which is becoming very um, very important in, in, in our research programs and it, indeed in our, in our practice. Uh, the second is the, the, the intersection of what a lot of people are calling IT and OT. Uh, the physical world, IOT and so on, is coming in in a big way. We might be securing our IT networks, but guess what? Some, some, somebody just connected the, uh, the, the elevator to the, the backbone. Uh, the elevators, the, the point of vulnerability, and so on. So making sure that the, as we make our buildings, our cars, our, our vehicles, our watches, and whatever else, wearables, and so on, part of the enterprise footprint is opening up completely new areas. It might be catch-up, like you said, yeah. uh, but, you know, boy, there is a lot of catching up to be done there. 
Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I, I don't know if there's significant innovation or greenfield uh, situations, but you know, we, ha we have the algorithms that were developed in the 70s and we're now starting to see them to be applied, whether it's supervised or unsupervised machine uh, learning algorithms or artificial intelligence as a, as a higher level being applied to the analytics problem. Um, in certain domains, you see that being applied to the authentication problem when you don't trust the end user typing in a password, so the server-side analytics being the primary form of authentication. That's mostly on the consumer solutions. Uh, my years at Yahoo and others at Google and others have focused on that, but that hasn't really come to the enterprise uh, quite significantly. So I, I think that's one area of, of possibility in the future. Um, we, we've had eras of the past which I think we will revisit. So network authentication control systems, I think that will come back in a more simplified approach. DRM, historically as a lot of dead bodies on that road uh, <laughs> as companies have tried, but we, we're starting to see new stabs at it with a deeply interconnected world, uh, having the key management servers in the cloud, et cetera, and being leveraged on mobile devices such as Ionic and Vera and other companies have down that space. Um, I still think there's some fundamental problems that have not been solved in the industry. Source code analytics being one of them. Yep. Application layer is roughly 90% of all security issues, yep. and yet we've only had maybe four or five, maybe even six companies even attempt at doing that. That's a hard problem, and I think one that we need to solve. Um, authentication being more transparent, more server side, whether it's behavioral or otherwise, is another major component. It's not an evolution or a innovation in the security model, but how that model is applied to the technologies that we, we use and as that changes, how's it go, as it goes forward. Uh, great, those are some, some great ideas. Thank you for that. So I know there are a lot of um, entrepreneurs in the audience, uh, founders of startups, and um, oftentimes they ask me and others, um, how do they approach um, big organizations such as, such as yours, yours? How do they target the CISOs? How do they pitch to your, your companies, what are some of the, um, um, you know, some of the advice that you can provide to these entrepreneurs? So, I get pitched every day in email and on the phone calls about 20 times a day. I get pitched all the time. The problem with the big companies, and I'm lucky I'm in research, I can actually work with small startups, but big companies tend to look at small startups as a liability because you as, a, as an issue. But to pitch, make sure you know what your product does. Make sure you're well prepared. And remember, you may only get 5, 10, 15 minutes with somebody like me sometimes. Uh, I, I, as, as part of my job, I run uh, the innovation partnerships. Um, and one very important part of that is our uh, alliance with startups. So there is a team in TCS which which works with startups and incubates them in some ways and takes them either as, as suppliers to us or partners in the global market. So we have uh, about a thousand startups on our radar at any point in time. So we know how, what, how the process works. But if I have to give a word of advice to the startups who come and pitch uh, to, to my colleagues in my team or to myself, uh, keep the big picture in mind. A lot of startups get very excited about this, the, the, the very you know, niche problem that they have solved but get a feel for what that is in the larger picture because it, it might be a widget which is interesting but it's not something I really want to work on at this moment. Yeah, and I, I think it's desire and vehicle. Um, so one, you know, CISOs or, or whoever you're selling to it, there needs to be a desire. For me personally, I get really excited. Uh, about startups, is there an opportunity for innovation? Then it becomes a vehicle. Um, of course, leverage your investment uh, founders. Obviously, Wild Ventures uh, being amazing. I, I love sitting down and having a conversation uh, about any uh, company that, that you're looking at. To, is that innovative for us? Um, and then a direct email. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of companies send a direct email. It's sit down, have a coffee, do the pitch. I'm not as worried about the format, the structure, because I do it a lot and you kind of figure out it, uh, figure the mechanics uh, of it and give some advice. But to an entrepreneur, I would say it, not, it might be a great idea. I've passed on a lot of great ideas. Um, it just might not be applicable for us at that time. So that critical feedback, uh, take it for what it is and, and keep on track. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panelists.
Thanks, Mike. Thanks. تفاجأت إسرائيل ومعها العالم بقيام آلاف الهاتفات.